Okay, um, so welcome everybody. Uh, we're happy to have uh, Andy Mannion here who will tell us about uh, GL11 and hypertoric uh, varieties. Okay, hi everyone. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I'm up here bright and early. Hopefully this will go all right. Um, but I'm here to talk about a, a joint project with Aaron Lauda and Tony Licata that I find to be very exciting. It sort of brings in a whole bunch of different things um, from my background in Hagard floor homology, that's sort of where I got started with this circle of ideas. And GL11 categorification is something that is well known to be related to that through many sort of conjectural and known ways. But then this project also started to bring in other perspectives that we weren't um, expecting to see. Uh, most notably two things, hypertoric varieties, which is something I'm going to try to talk about today and then uh, amplitudehedra in physics and that we find to be especially exciting. We definitely weren't expecting to stumble across that in this project, um, but we did and I think one of the co-authors of this uh, Carp Williams paper that helped us so much is in the audience so hopefully I will say something of interest along those lines but probably not as much as you might like because I'm going to try to motivate this from more of a representation theory perspective. So. Um, let's say section one will be about GL11 and then the thing that I studied in grad school and still study, which is Hagard floor homology. Okay, and we're gonna start with something that I hope is more or less familiar um, to this audience. Um, is the representation theory of quantum groups namely a view Q of G, where we can say in the most standard case, G is a complex semi-simple Lie algebra, and U Q of G is its quantized universal enveloping algebra or quantum group. And this has um, lots of connections to topology and physics. And for topology, I'll say, of U Q of G, meaning finite dimensional representations of U Q of G, uh, is a ribbon tensor category. And from there, you can get invariants for colored tangles and links, such as the Jones polynomial. Um, so these are topological invariants in low dimensional topology. And another thing you can say is from rep of UQ of G, you can build a modular tensor category by passing to a root of unity and performing other modifications. And this will give TQFT invariance of three manifolds. So this is another way in which rep UQ of G is related to topology, a very, a very related way to that first point. Sorry if I'm sort of repetitive. Uh, it was suggested that I make slides for online talks, but um, things have been a little bit busy and I didn't get around to it. So hopefully, hopefully writing on the tablet is okay. Um, okay, and for physics, I'll just say all of this fits into string theory. And I don't want to go too much into that perspective here. There's a lot of different angles you could take on this, but I'm going to take one particular angle in this talk. Okay, um, so that is most standard when G is a complex semi-simple Lie algebra, but you could also ask what happens when G is a super Lie algebra, for instance, GL11 or GLNN more generally. So G super the algebra, e.g. GL11. Um, well, you can you can have similar things, although so you have um, rep Q of well let, let's say it this way rep of U Q of GL11 
is still a ribbon tensor category, like in the complex semi-simple case. Um, and so it gives closed link invariants. Those are all zero, in fact. But you can instead say, I'm going to look at invariants for, say, 1, 1 tangles or for 0, 2 tangles. And I'm going to say those are in bijection with, say, closed knots and links, um, at least if I have a chosen component, because I, I can cut open that uh, a link at that component and get a 1, 1 tangle. And so now these invariants are not all 0, and they recover the Alexander polynomial. Um, OK, um, and you can also say, well, OK, how about for three manifold invariants in general? Um, <clears throat> well, without needing to pass to a root of unity or doing the more complicated things that seem to be re required for this in the semi-simple case, the Alexander polynomial itself fits into a lot of three-dimensional constructions that don't really seem to require Q at all, let alone Q to be a root of unity. Um, so there's many ways to extend. So sort of unlike in the case of general G of say G equals SL2, you might think is more simple, but in fact, for this purpose, GL11 is especially a very special case. So there's all sorts of Riedemeister torsions and things like that that extend the Alexander polynomial to a three manifold setting. So not always using, but it would be very interesting to do it via some sort of modular category. Or, but I mean, that it can't be true on the nose, but something closer to the usual quantum setup would be interesting to investigate. Um, and I want to say, especially um, this is the case of GL11 or GLNN um, in the string theory picture it is a very special case. So um, you can show, this is outlined really nicely in this paper of Gukov, Putrov, and Vafa from a few years ago, um, how Hagard floor or Zyberg-Witten theory should be related to GL11 by some sort of geometric transition in the brain setup behind this physical picture. So um, when studying quantum representations of GL11, an important thing is that they're unlike in the general case, there should be this alternate description in mind. And that may be leading to the fact that it's easier to define three manifold invariants here than in the general case. Um, so this, that's an alternate description. And I'll just call that Cyberguitten theory. And that Hagard floor homology is uh, an approach to Zyberguitten theory. OK, um, so <clears throat> this is all for quantum invariance. You can ask about categorification then. Um, so categorified or higher representation theory of UQ of G. Well, it has similar connections to invariants and topology, except the invariants tend to be more powerful. Um, so you have Kovanov homology lifting the Jones polynomial and providing more data. You have HFK lifting the Alexander polynomial and providing more data in a lot of really nice ways. For instance, HFK detects the genus of a knot. It's only bounded by the Alexander polynomial. So categorification can be really interesting to study for topological and other reasons.
and I want to especially focus on the GL11 case, where I want to say a little bit about what is Haggard flow homology, because that's something studied a lot in topology, and I'm hoping that as time goes forward, it starts to be studied more from a more algebraic and representation theoretic point of view as well, but that's very new in some sense. And so just say a little bit about um, Haggard flow homology, just a, a few sentences about it. Um, so the categorification, alternate description, or alternate cyber witten description, This can be studied um, with the theory of Haggard floor homology. So I can think of the theory as just being Haggard floor homology if I want, but Haggard floor homology sort of implies one way of thinking about and computing things. And this was introduced by Ojvath and Abo in around the year 2000. And what it does is it gives, well, invariance uh, for three manifolds, which take the form of homology groups. So already this is something that's very hard to do in say SL2 categorification, defining homology groups for three manifolds, but this is sort of the first part of the theory of Haggard flow homology. And for smooth four manifolds, and these are more numerical invariants. And these actually are very good at detecting exotic smooth structures. Um, so that is one of the major selling points of the theory from, from its origins. Uh, the, the, the problem of detecting different smooth structures on a smooth four manifold and telling that they're not diffeomorphic, although they're homeomorphic, that's a very um, difficult problem in four dimensions. Topology, and this is one of the best theories at addressing questions like that. So it detects exotic smooth structures. And we already said it was a, a variant of cybert witten theory. It's a way of computing cybert witten theory. Well, the definitions, unlike in most categorified things, uh, analysis is required in general, but Usually it's tractable. It's more tractable than gauge theoretic analysis, for instance. The PDEs involved are, you can get more intuition, more hands-on concrete results that let you compute with it. And you can even make the theory, you can go really far and make the theory algebraic or at least combinatorial in many situations. Um, but can often do it. So you can often just do the analysis and in, in certain situations, and that suffices to algebraicize the theory. And then you can forget about the analysis afterwards and think in terms of the algebraic formulation. Um, so that is just a little bit of overview about quantum invariants and their categorifications. And then this a special case that we're going to be focusing on, which is GL11 and this theory of Haggard Fleur homology on the topological side. So um, Haggard Fleur homology, I just want to say it can give new insights into algebraic categorification because it comes from a different world. So it's sort of a new fresh source of ideas in a certain way if you can find the relationships. But that is part one of this talk um, on GL11 and Haggard floor homology. In part two, I want to talk a little bit about um, how you categorify things. Or here's one standard way that things are categorified. And then we'll see a GL11 example that's kind of like this, but is also new in certain ways. So this I'll say a geometric slash rep theoretic source of categorifications. And this is going to be, well, category O um, and the corresponding geometry 
and varieties that sort of underlie that, at least conjecturally. And I want to, I'm hoping that this is a perspective that will be at least somewhat familiar to some people in the audience. And then um, hopefully this helps explain a little bit about our project by analogy. But I'll also be discussing a paper with Aaron Lauda from last year um, that's a little bit more directly related to Category O and that you know, thinking about that paper and following up on that directly led into this project. So you could go, you could give this talk in a bunch of different orders. I gave one last week that is entirely differently structured, but I'm going to try it this way this time. So, so let's talk about category O as a rep theoretic source of categorifications, at least a little bit. I'm not even going to say what it is, but um, you have a nice structure when you're categorifying, let's say, let's say I take the following thing. Um, I have some wedge power of, um, let's say this is um, C to the A, tensor dot, 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 tensor. Um, and let's say it's even CQ, which is defined to be rational functions, okay, because I want to talk about the quantum versions. And let's say, um, and these are wedge products, so exterior powers of the defining representation of UQ of GLA or SLA. And if I consider some tensor product of wedge powers like this, this is a representation of UQ of GLA, and I can look at a weight space. Um, mu1 through mu a of this, okay, where um, so this is, let's say this is a of uq of g l of a, and this is a weight space. Okay, and then here we're going to say, um, mu and nu, so mu1 through mu a and nu1 through nu b are compositions of some of some integer, the same integer, compositions of some n. There's a condition you have to satisfy like mu plus is less than or equal to nu transpose, something like that. I don't want to emphasize that. Um, and and I want to, I do want to note that this is, there's a duality that relates this particular weight space of this representation to the other thing I could do, mu, wedge mu one, CB, Q tensor dot dot dot, tensor wedge mu A, CB, Q in weight space, nu one through dot dot dot, nu B. So now this is a representation of a different thing. This is a representation of UQ of GL of B, and now this is again a weight space. But it's for a different, for GLB weight, not a GLA weight. And this is skew how duality, or this is, this follows from skew how duality. Okay, and this is a weight space of some representation, and I want a category whose, um, I can extract some growth in the group or some decategorification of the category that's going to recover this vector space. And then I want to categorify, well, one wants in general to categorify the quantum group actions on these things and the intertwining maps that you get that commute with the quantum group actions. Uh, but the first thing to do is categorify these particular vector spaces. And to do that, you can use categorify, uh, you can use category O. Um, Bernstein, Gelfand, Gelfand, if I've got that right. Um, it's a certain category of highest weight modules um, that I'm not going to define. So to categorify this, um, use the BGG category. Oh, well, I'm really going to look at a certain block of a parabolic version of this. Um, so this, if I'm going to focus on wedge mu1 of CQA tensor dot, 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 tensor wedge mu b of CQA in weight space 
mu one through dot, 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 mu a, it can be categorified by, well, two things because we have this duality. So one is I can say, there's this thing called O mu nu of GL of N, where N is that number that both mu and nu are compositions of. And this is going to be a parabolic, mu is going to determine a parabolic subalgebra of GLN, and then the modules are going to have to have a particular behavior with respect to that parabolic subalgebra. And then this is going to determine a so-called block. So this, if I just look at this whole category O, even in the parabolic case, it's going to decompose into these various blocks that I don't want to really say what they are. But um, that's what that lower, lower label is supposed to indicate. Um, and then by this duality, I could use this style of thing instead, where I put the, the new as the upper index and the mu as the lower index. So I'm changing the role of the parabolic and the block. And this is a Kazool duality in general. OK, so this is a more or less standard picture. And you can think of this as a global perspective. This is an, of something that has local and even microlocal perspectives as well, at least conjecturally. So you can make it more local. And I'm even going to go as far as possible, I think. Um, at least, you know, sketch it or say one sentence about it. Um, so uh, you can make this more local by considering certain holomorphic symplectic manifolds and looking at their Foucault categories. And these categories, well, they should, in various cases, have a sort of global description. There's arguments in physics that indicate that. And these category O, instances would be the global description. Um, in certain cases, that's known. Um, so we're going to consider uh, certain holomorphic symplectic manifolds. And I will call them S tilde mu nu. This is so since I've been working with Tony on this project, we've especially been looking at these papers of uh, Braden, Lakata, Proudfoot, and Webster um, that were one of the main things that, you know, one of the main sources of things that we cite in our, in our paper that we build our worldview from, sort of. Um, and they call these things S3 varieties. And so I'll just use that name here. But the S tilde mu nu indexed by the same type of mu and nu as above. And then what, what do I want to consider about these? Um, well, Fukaya categories of S3 varieties, S tilde mu nu, um, should have global descriptions. Well, global description, namely, I'll be kind of rough. I'm not entirely sure what's proven and conjectured here or whether there's some modifications of the statement I need to make. But um, what I want to think is that when I look at this category O as a source of categorifying this particular weight space, I could think of that as that's really encoding some underlying geometry, or at least hopefully it can be thought of that way. And this leads to um, the sort of symplectic Kavana homology program where you study the Fukai categories and you try to recover the link invariance in terms of the Fukai categories of these holomorphic symplectic manifolds. OK. Um, and I want to especially talk about two special cases that are going to be very important in this talk. And let's say, um, let's take mu to be the composition n minus 1 at uh, 1 of, of n. So this is two numbers summing to n. We're going to take mu to be the trivial composition of n, 1, 1, 1. Um, <clears throat> so then what is this variety? Well, let me just say by fiat what it is. 
this S3 variety is the Milner fiber of the type AN minus one uh, surface singularity. And this was studied by Kovanov and Seidel about 20 years ago. So, Kovanov Seidel showed that in, indeed um, this Fukai category can be understood in simpler terms. Fukai category of this particular thing, n minus one, 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 dot, 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 one, um, is equivalent to A mod where A is a finite dimensional Kozul algebra that's often called the kovanov seidel quiver algebra. Andy, can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, the variety for S1 and minus one, is that the same thing or is it just equivalent? Or yes, that, well, that is going to be the same thing, I think. Um, I'm pretty, yeah, in, in this situation, well, do I wanna commit myself to that? Um, definitely the algebra is going to be the same. I'm okay. Uh, I think it's the same. I think it, I think the ordering actually doesn't matter on these, on these things up isomorphism, although, I mean, it comes into the definition, but, um, as far as I understand, as some of these things, I'm not an expert in, I have to admit. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think it's true though. Okay, and this is, um, so this is, and this is known to describe at the time of their paper, the category O version. O, um, which one do I want? N minus one, one in the parabolic, and then I want the regular block. So if I have nu equals one, 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 it's more common to call that just zero, sort of as an SLN way or than GLN. And um, that is the regular block. And so this, you can take it to categorify C squared Q tensor dot, 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 tensor C squared Q and minus one, one, if I want a GL2 weight. So that's a sort of one-off weight space of uh, tensor power of just the defining representation of GL2. Um, or I can think of it in a dual perspective as categorifying a different weight space of a GLN representation. Okay. Um, so this, that's, that's one especially interesting case. Uh, another interesting case is sort of dual to this. Uh, if I take mu to be one dot 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 one instead and then mu uh, to be n minus one one, um, well then I have this particular S3 variety is actually just a cotangent bundle of complex projective space. Well, I guess a priori it's T star of ger n minus one n of C, but I can think of that then n planes versus lines are sort of equivalent. Um, oops, not trace star, but T star, it's early. Cotangent bundle. It's a cotangent bundle of complex projective space. CP. Um, um, I have that right, don't I? Lines in, no, n minus one. Lines in CN is CPN minus one, that's right. Um, okay, and then, so now if I want to look at the Fukai category of this thing, this is also understood, first by work of Nadler Zaslow and then by a bunch of other stuff. Um, and I don't want to go into too much detail. So get a sheaves description and then things like um, BGG localization and the Riemann Hilbert correspondence, things that I'm not an expert on, um, will say that yes, this is describing a certain singular block in this case of non parabolic category O. So this is sort of if I put just 111 at the top, that just means it's just the Borel, it's not, not parabolic. Um, 
Okay, and this is also has a nice description in terms of a finite dimensional Kozul algebra, namely the Kozul dual of the first one. So a shriek mod where a shriek is the Kozul dual of the, the Kovanov Seidel quiver algebra. Okay, and this can be viewed as categorifying um, well, under it, it can categorify the same white space, except that I'm using the dual perspective, or it can be viewed as categorifying a different thing, a certain weight space of a GLN representation. Um, okay, so that's all good, but how about the thing that this talk is supposed to be about, which is GL11? Is there, so we, we just got done talking a lot about, or not, well, talking slowly, but not saying a lot, I guess, about categorifying certain weight spaces of certain representations by using category O. Now, how about GL11 representations? So, so let V equals, let's, let's write it this way, CQ to the one, one. So that's sort of a two dimensional vector space. Really one of those dimensions is even and the other one is odd, so you say it's one one dimensional. Um, and then, well, Sartori, um, what is it, 14? Well, okay, I'm not going to commit myself. I think it's 14. Um, categorifies, um, I could be, I can look this up, can't I? Uh, the archive paper says 15, uh, but it was first, okay, it's close enough. Um, okay, but he categorifies weight spaces of, so let's just take the case when we just want to take all the wedge powers to be wedge one, okay? And then we want weight spaces of a defining representation tensored with itself a bunch of times, except now we're gonna take the defining representation of GL11. Um, just sort of like a GL2, GL11 has a two dimensional or a rank two weight lattice. Um, and so I'm going to put two integers as the weights. Okay. And Sartori doesn't use, as opposed to if this were GL2 and not GL11, you might think, okay, I'm going to use parabolic k, comma, n minus k, and I'm going to take the regular block. Um, and Sartori does something kind of related to that, but he does something different. Um, does a category, so instead of k comma n minus k, the parabolic is just k one dot 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 one. Uh, but now he's going to take a presentable quotient, a so-called presentable quotient of this, which is something that had been introduced previously. So this is in some sense determines a subcategory of the full category O, and this determines a quotient. So this is a subquotient, the full category O, still the regular block of GLN. Okay, and then this in turn is equivalent to A N K mod for um, some finite dimensional algebra A N K and these are studied by Sartori. So this in some sense is a natural GL11 piece of the story. Um, and it's just that you modify the category O picture um, in this particular way. And so I don't wanna say too much about his categorification. He's just using these things. Um, uh, I do want to point out that note, well, a n one, that's going to, if I take, um, if I look at the presentable bit that makes this different from what I said above, if, uh, do I have it wrong? Uh, e, sorry, yeah, I, I messed that up. So n minus k one dot 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 one comma and then the quotient is one dot 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 one k so it's backwards from what I first said uh, because 
prez. Okay, because um, when k equals one, then the presentable bit is just doesn't do anything. You get o n minus one one o of g l n, and indeed a n one is isomorphic to the Kovanov set L algebra A. So we see that it comes up in SL2 or GL2 categorification, but it also comes up in this Sartori category approach to GL11 categorification. Okay, and then none of the other ones, all, all of the other Sartori algebras are a little bit weird. Okay. Um, so that is what I wanted to say in this part two about uh, a geometric source of categorification with category O, and then we are relating this back to um, the GL11 case where you can do similar things and that's work of Sartori. Now I want to bring in the Hagard Fleur perspective. So this is going to be category O and Hagard Fleur homology. And so, what I want to do is there's actually algebras in Hagard fleur homology that, that play a similar, similar role to these ANK algebras. Um, so, and especially I'm thinking of algebras that were introduced by Ojvah Sabo uh, about four years ago now. Here, I'm stuck from my back of my chair here. Sorry. Um, so there exist algebras in Hagard floor theory. Playing a similar role to A and K. And there's reasons for that. Again, I, I could say exactly why you suspect that they're playing a similar role, but let me just say that they are. And so that you would like to compare these algebras. Um, and especially algebras introduced by Ojvah Sabo in 2016. Part of a theory that they call bordered HFK. It's very good at computing HFK, which is sort of like Kovanov homology, except the Hagard floor version. Um, and these are certain infinite dimensional algebras. And we're going to, there's various versions. Um, so the version that I'm going to talk about here is I'm going to call it BL of NK. Why BL? Because there's versions BR, there's B without an LRR, there's BLR in some sense, which is just called B prime. But this is an infinite dimensional algebra, basically because it's an algebra where not, you know, in some sense, some of these polynomial actions survive. It's an algebra over a polynomial ring. Let's say, well, I'll say Z for now. Sometimes you cheat and go to F2, but BL of NK is an algebra over a polynomial ring. And often there will be arbitrarily high power of these polynomials that will be non-vanishing in this algebra. And so this is an infinite dimensional algebra. But here's some things that do vanish. So the elementary symmetric polynomials ek plus 1 of u1 through un all the way up to en of u1 through un which is just the product of all those variables, these vanish in BL of NK. Okay, so um, you have these algebras, they're infinite dimensional. Uh, some symmetric polynomials in these UI variables already um, die, but not all of them. But here's the theorem that Aaron and I proved last summer. And this is that if I really do kill the rest of the elementary symmetric polynomials in this Oshvath Sabo algebra, then I get Sartori's algebra. So A and K is the quotient of BL of NK by 
E1 of U1 dot 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 through UN. So the ideal generated by these lower degree symmetric polynomials, because I, I could take all the symmetric polynomials. I don't need to take the higher ones. Um, and in fact, okay, there's a certain basis of A of NK. It's free as a, a Z module on this basis given by so-called fork elements. And then this uh, BL of NK, it's, it's a free module over these first K symmetric polynomials on the same basis. Um, but so I don't want to um, get too much into those bases. I just want to say example. So when K equals one, so A N one equals the Kovanov Seidel algebra A is a quotient of BL of N1. And this is something that sort of, I, it's not too hard to realize this. And I had already realized this a while ago in grad school. It's much more difficult to understand what's going on in the case of general K. Um, but this is something so that was already considered in grad school, let's see. And in fact, you can say something about bimodules, not just about algebras in this case. So let me just, because I like to set my own results in years when I'm on the market, let me just say theorem Mannion 16 uh, is that Kovanov's or Kovanov Seidel's braiding bimodules, okay? So for a, a braid, that's going to go between two sets of endpoints where the endpoints are going to give me these types of representations that we're trying to categorify. So then a braid should give me a functor between these categorifications. A categorifications are module categories. So the braid will give me a bimodule over the algebras. And in fact, um, that's true in the kovanov seidel setting, and that's true in the Ojval sabo setting, and the bimodules are compatible, which is actually pretty surprising because of how complicated the Ojval sabo ones are. Um, and can I ask you a question? These, yes. These BLN case, they're not DG algebras? They are not DG algebras. They're the homology of certain formal DG algebras. There are also DG variants where if I am trying to do mixed orientations, mm -hmm. strands pointing both up and down, you can deal with that in their theory that you introduce new variables in and you give them a differential. Um, and those are, but the ones that I'm talking about here specifically in this talk and also in the paper with Aaron and Tony and the paper with Aaron last summer, all of these are just ordinary, um, associative algebras, they're infinite dimensional and they arise as, they should be DG, but they're the homology of formal DG algebras. And is there a braiding on the DG level for the DG enhancements of BL and K? Um, that is a question that Mike and Marco and I hope to address in follow-up work to our two papers from last year. Okay. That's that sort of paper, paper three of that project that if I thought, I think, did Mar is Marco here? Well, um, Sadly, I think he was unable to make it. But yes, we're, we hope to address that. That that's something that would be. It shouldn't be too hard. We've we've written it down more or less what the answer is. It's just that it's a matter of writing up kind of, which is kind of a pain in this stuff. The the bimodules are very complicated and it's a notational mess. Thanks. But yes. Okay. Good. Now that's a very good question. Um, Kovanov Zedel's braiding bimodule. I just sorry. I just want to take this is compatible with Ojval Sabos. Okay. Okay, so that's K equals one, um, where we have this bimodule compatibility. For general K, we have this result with Aaron that relates the Sartori algebras with the Ojval Sabo ones. But now let's say, okay, so for K equals N minus one, so, um, a n comma n minus one is not equal to this causal dual um, of the Kovanov-Seidel algebra. So the Sartori, this is Sartori's algebra here. 
And we know that's a quotient of BL of NN minus one, but that's, that's just not the same as the Kozul dual that we had looked at before, okay? And this leads me in directly to the last section of this talk, which is hypertoric varieties. Is it 50 minutes or an hour? Never specified, um, so just somewhere between 50 and an hour. Okay, that's good. I, I, um, I should definitely be done by 15 minutes from now, hopefully earlier than that. Um, there's a lot more I could say, but I am tired, so <laughs> and probably some of you guys are too. So um, I'm going to start out, this, this whole project started out with what I think of as a very spooky observation. Is that uh, although it is not true that a and n minus one is the same as this Kozul dual, so the the project with Aaron from last summer gives you no reason to think that B L of n n minus one should be related to a shriek. Um, so although, but on, on the other hand, that's true. Although although a n n minus one is not a shriek. Um, it's also true, and we had no idea why for a while, um, that A shriek is a quotient of BL of N, N minus one. So both A, N, N minus one is a quotient and A shriek is a quotient. And this is um, in some sense simpler it's only by a, by a bunch of linear, a quotient by an ideal generated by linear polynomials in the UIs, not even needing any higher degree polynomials. Whereas in um, this other setting, you would have to take the, well, okay. It's simpler, I, I think of it as simpler, although a n n minus one is also a relatively simple quotient of VL. Okay, um, but is let me summarize what's going on as follows. So B L of N one, you take an easy quotient, you get A, that's the Kovanov Seidel algebra, that's A N one. And then I say, okay, that's describing O at minus one one. And then the regular block, let me just put zero for the regular block of G L N. And now this is by Kovanov Seidel's work related to the Fukai category of the Milner fiber. That's one side, and now there's this other side that is sort of unexpected. Why you would have this other side, even if you are okay with the left column here. So this also has an easy quotient. Uh, Andy, sorry, yes. could you remind me what, why, uh, where, where in the uh... Hagar floor, bordered Hagar floor theory, BL and K comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like, it geometrically, like, uh, what's the, uh, what was their motivation? Is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is it, you know, to control tangles, uh, to find tangle functors or something? Yes, yes. It's associated to, if you want, it's a particular parameterization of an unpunctured disk and it's it's to serve as the algebra at the endpoint of a tangle with n endpoints especially when all of the orientations are one particular direction but yes so is it is it related to uh uh the bordered floor homology for the uh, or sorry algebra for the uh in punctured disk yes that's the dg enhancement and that's so that's the thing to which it's quasi-isomorphic. This is the homology of, of that thing. And uh, so K is the uh, uh, K is the spin grading or level or, and K L is, is something else? Like the K, L is something else. L is not an integer. L is like left versus right. So L is okay. not another integer. There's only two integers going on, N and K. And N is the number of endpoints and then k is and so that's going to be the number of red arcs 
or matching arcs in your parameterization of this surface. And so, so uh, K is the uh, number of that are occupied. I understand now. Um, so, but you're dealing with um, uh, BL and K as an algebra, not as an A infinity algebra. Right. It's okay. um, and the, these algebras in general, although they describe Foucault categories, these DG strands algebras are always DG. And then their homology may have A infinity actions in general, but it turns out that in this case, they're formal. And okay. this, this is just an ordinary algebra in that case. Thanks. Thanks. I'm caught up now. Sorry. Cool. No problem. No problem. Um, so just to fill in this other column here, um, if I take this Kuzul dual algebra, as we said before, that's related to this singular block n minus one, one of category O, and then this is related to Fukaya categories of T star of CP n minus one. And so the question is going to be, can we interpolate? for one less than k, less than n, uh, n minus one. And that, that was what led us to this project. We can make a first guess, okay, based on the category O. We're going to say, guess, we're going to just start moving things from the parabolic to the block. So we can say, O n minus k one dot 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 one. And let me try, one dot 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 one k um, of GLN. And I'm not going to, okay, maybe I've got the order incorrect. Maybe, maybe I don't, but I think it doesn't matter by the same conversation as before. Um, and you can ask about this and say, is this related to Ojval Sabo's algebra? Is Ojval Sabo's algebra have a quotient, for instance, that's going to be a uh, finite dimensional Kozul algebra describing this? And the answer seems to be no. Oshval Sabo's algebra has too many idempotents for that. And so another guess, well, you can think of it as follows. If I look at this particular S3 variety coming from that guess above, this is actually what's known as a hypertoric variety. Um, and I don't want to say what that is other than it sort of means that it's combinatorial. It can be studied. You know, it's a little bit easier to get your hands on than these S3 varieties, which are relatively complicated. Um, this has a lot of, um, you know, a lot of combinatorics you can do associated with hypertoric varieties, and that makes it easy to work with, and that's nice, and that helped us out a lot. Um, it comes from a hyperplane arrangement, um, and in this case, it's one that's not in general position, but there's a related class of general position arrangement of general position arrangements. And these are what is, are known as um, the relevant ones turn out to be the so-called cyclic hyperplane arrangements. And these start to bring in the math of the positive Grossmannian. And this is where the amplitude-hedron connection eventually um, came about because there was this paper of Karp and Williams and we saw the same, we, the, when we saw the pictures in that paper, we were like, oh, these are the exact same things. And look at this whole paper on the combinatorics of these things that we want to understand the combinatorics of. And then it was just a week or so before we, you know, went from finding that paper into having a main proof of the theorem. I'll state in just a second. Um, but there is cyclic hyperplane arrangements. They're related to the concept of total positivity. 
related to total positivity. And um, then these um, S3 varieties, there are eight, really the hyperplane arrangements underlying these as hypertoric varieties. Well, they sort of arise when you when you relax total positivity to total non-negativity. So in some sense, we're thinking of the first guess at an, interp in, at an interpolating family is pretty good as a guess, but it's too degenerate. And we just make it, we go to the most natural thing nearby. That's, that's a more generic class of arrangements. And these are these cyclic arrangements. Um, and then we are able to find as nice of a relationship for all K as we could have dreamed of. That's going to be the answer. But I just want to say these arise. And this is something that we'd like to pursue further. We just briefly, I actually don't think we mentioned it in our draft, um, but the relationship with these particular S3 varieties. Um, but they really arise when relaxing to total non-negativity. But we're really going to care about these cyclic cases. They're really totally positive ones. OK. Um, so modulo omitted details, there's basically, there's only one cyclic arrangement up to equivalence for each n and k. OK. Although it may seem that you need to choose a lot more data than that, there's a notion of equivalence on these things. OK, and so now, so what is this? I need to state our theorem. Um, now, if V is any hyperplane arrangement, including one of these cyclic ones, and we need to um, specify that it's rational as well, in some sense, then you have a so-called hypertoric variety associated to that. Let's call that MV. And then in Braden, I caught a, oops, Proudfoot and Webster. Um, well, they define certain algebras in the context of these hypertoric varieties. They define, so what would we be thinking? If it's like an S3 variety, okay, um, and if these S3 varieties for this interpolating family, these are actually hypertoric varieties, okay, so we're thinking there's, there's some non-trivial overlap, and uh, the Fukai categories, um, you should hope that it's described by some finite dimensional Kozul algebra. And that's what these authors define. Let's call it um, B of V. And it's conjecturally describing the chi category of MV. And they also define an infinite dimensional version. That's a deformation of it of B of V. And this is called B tilde of V. And these were especially of interest to us because rather than just looking for a quotient relationship, that means we can actually look for an isomorphism. So finally, I can state the theorem that this talk was building up towards. Theorem about a Nakata and myself in just this year. Um, is that for cyclic V uh, given N and K, and so there's one equivalence class of cyclic V. I'm omitting a few details there, um, but you have, really I mean so-called left cyclic, um, you have B tilde of V as isomorphic to, not just a quotient relationship, but really an isomorphism of algebras, is isomorphic to BL of NK. And there's some intuition behind this that, um, so I'm not, 
for time constraints I can't get into exists intuition. I just do want to say one thing about um, exists intuition, exists a more general conjecture that would imply this. And so that's how our paper is written, is to sort of focus on what we think should be the appropriate explanation for this result, this conjectural Fukaya interpretation of B tilde of V in terms of the complexified hyperplane complement. But I'll just say for now, there exists a more general conjecture. And for the proof, I just want to say um, it, it used combinatorial methods. Building on those and using those where appropriate. I mean, it was very useful paper um, of Carp and Williams in 2016. Uh, and this is where the really exciting connection to the amplitudehedron comes in. Um, and if I had more time, it would be great to talk more about that, but I don't really. I'm already a minute over the, the long version. But this is very exciting in some sense, an area of physics in which locality and unitarity are seen to be emergent properties in this formulation of physics, rather than something you um, build in from the beginning. And um, the last thing I want to say is that we do have further results in preparation, is that B tilde of V in general, and thus BL of NK, um, is the so-called affine quasi-hereditary algebra. And this might seem like a technical condition, but what it really does is gives you um, lots of information about the module theory about these things. And especially, it gives you so-called standard modules And so these are um, especially important when trying to relate to, um, so there's this paper that uh, I've been working on for a while with Raphael Ruquier, and it is finally on the archive as of Monday. Um, and that's about higher tensor products of two representations and especially in this geo one one setting um where we define such a higher tensor product and relate it to Haggard floor homology and if you want to relate um bl of nk to this style of mathematics it's very good to have a set of standard modules so that I can sort of change basis away from a canonical basis to just a standard tensor product basis for one of these tensor product representations. Um, but for now, I'll just say it's especially important when trying to bring in uh, higher tensor products of two representations and now I can finally say, without saying in preparation, I can say M um, Rukia 20. And that is a very satisfying last thing to write as the last thing I read in a talk. So that's all I've got. Thank you very much for your time. I apologize for going a few minutes over. Let's thank Andy. So I'm gonna stop the recording and then we can take questions. <laughs>